Thank you, team. Matt, thank you for standing in for Pastor Sean. Great job, my friend. Hey, I want to welcome those live streaming. Um, pull out your Bibles or your devices and open them up to Romans chapter 4. You want to follow along? Notes are in the center of the bulletin or they're on the app there as well. You know, um, a while back I was in New York City walking through the streets there. And it's kind of an interesting place to go. If you've ever been to New York City, uh, just a, well, quite an interesting and fascinating place to be and to walk around. Uh, one afternoon it began to rain, and within moments, little stations began to pop up up and down the streets selling, well, umbrellas. Uh, and then uh, if it got a little chilly, there'd be people out there selling little, little jackets. And uh, well, one day I'm walking through, and there's these little stands, and well, they're selling Rolex watches. Now, I don't know about you, but I've always thought it'd be cool to have a, have a Roly, right? I wouldn't mind having one of those. I thought I'd look good with one of those. And so, well, I began to talk with the guy, and I'm thinking, well, how do I know this is like, you know, authentic Rolex? I mean, for one, he's selling it on the streets in New York City, which is, you know, a discerning guy like myself. It gives me pause. I'm thinking, maybe this isn't legitimate. But I begin to talk to him, and he's a very smooth-tongued salesman. I'm beginning to think, well, maybe this is right. So I look at the seal of authenticity is the, the hand movement, right? You can always tell a Rolex by the way it moves. And so I look at it. I'm thinking, well, it moves like a Rolex. It looks like a Rolex. I'm going to buy myself a Rolex. <laughs> so for $20, I got myself <laughs> a sweet Rolex. Now, it was about a day and a half later that I realized that there was another seal of authenticity that I should have, well, paid a bit more attention to. And, well, one was the price. Uh, the price was way too cheap for a Rolex. And so two days into this thing, well, it quit working. And I have it in my closet somewhere collecting dust as a memory of the moment that, well, I failed to follow my discerning, uh, you know, nature and I bought a Rolex. Now, hey, all in seriousness, I knew it was fake, but I thought it was fun to buy me a Rolex on the street because I knew one day I would tell you guys a story. <laughs> but you can buy anything in New York City. It's awesome. But the seal of authenticity is important when you're buying something, isn't it? You always look for this seal of authenticity. You want to know, is this an authentic uh, individual or an authentic item? For example, I was in Panama last week with a great missions team, and well, uh, there's some seal of authenticity of those who are on mission teams or, well, tourists. Uh, they're the ones wearing the Panama jack hats. Uh, they're the ones walking around staring at everything, taking pictures. Uh, they are the authentic tourists, you can just tell. Uh, they're also the ones who pay $10 to drink coconut water that has an awful flavor out of a giant coconut. You can tell, still of authenticity, that guy doesn't belong here. He is a tourist. He must be on one of those mission teams with the IMB. As we come to Romans chapter 4, it really is a seal of authenticity. And so I've entitled the message by that. Uh, and so let's go ahead and jump right in here to Romans chapter 4. Would you stand with me in honor of reading the Word of God? You can follow along on the screen, or there's pew Bibles in the pews. And the Apostle Paul begins his argument of justification by faith by the life of Abraham in verse 1. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, has found? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness, just as David also speaks of the blessing on the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Verse 7, blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. Verse 9, is this blessing then on the circumcised or on the uncircumcised also? For we say, faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it credited? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while uncircumcised, 
so that he might be the father of all who believe without being circumcised, that righteousness might be credited to them and the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but who also follow in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham, which he had while uncircumcised. Verse 13. For the promise to Abraham or to his descendants that he would be heir of the world was not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise is nullified. For the law brings about wrath, but where there is no law, there also is no violation. And so, Father, we pray that you'd help us to understand this passage, that we might see, well, justification by faith, that we might understand the, the seal of authenticity for the believer, that we might leave here knowing, loving, and, well, more ready and able to serve you. So, Father, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Speak to us in that still, small voice. Allow us to hear it. May we calm our minds and clear our thoughts to, in this moment, worship you by making you the most important thing in our lives. In Christ's name, amen. So here we are, Romans chapter 4. <clears throat> when the Jews wanted to discuss what makes them Jewish, they would go all the way back not to, well, David or Moses, but all the way back to the beginning, to Abraham. They wanted to go all the way back to the, to the physical beginner of the Hebrew race. It's much like what we do here. When we begin to talk about, well, who we are as a people, as United States citizens, we don't go back and we talk about, you know, a few presidents ago or even, you know, several presidents ago. We go all the way back to the beginning and we, we bring up the Constitution. We talk about George Washington and Thomas Jefferson because those are the ones who founded, well, this, uh, this country that we belong to. And we want to go back to them to, well, to prove who we are and how we got to where we are today. It's the same way with the Jewish people. If they want to discuss their heritage, they go back to Abraham. And let me tell you, if an honest examination of the life of Abraham reveals a man justified by obedience to the laws and rituals handed down by God, then, well, if we desire righteousness, then we better take note and follow his example, right? We better do exactly what he's done if he earned it. After all, Abraham was the physical and the spiritual father of God's chosen people. So if he earned it, then we got to earn it. And we're going to earn it the same way he did. And so Paul obviously does not believe that to be true. And so he poses a hypothetical condition here that he knows to be false in verses 1 and 2, uh, but he assumes it to be true for the sake of examination. So you saw it there in well, verses 1 and 2. Well, so what then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, has found? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about. So Paul's saying, so if this is true, then man, he can boast. He can boast because he was, well, made righteous by his works. And so anyhow, Paul, I mean, he can barely tolerate the idea, even the suggestion that anyone could earn their own righteousness through deeds. He just can't really take it. And so he begins to dive into this thing. But as we do, I want to set the tone for this message by giving you a biblical principle. It's there in your notes, and I want you to understand this. I want you to, to take away uh, this truth uh, from the message today. And here it is. It's working earns a wage, but trusting receives a gift. So working will earn you a wage, something you get for what you've done, but trusting receives a gift. That's the underlying principle here that Paul is teaching. I mean, look at verse 3 here. Do you see it? Check it out there. For what does the Scriptures say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. So rather dwell on this insane, crazy idea that anyone, even the venerated father of the Hebrew people, could earn their own righteousness. Paul just jumps right into this thing, and he begins by quoting Genesis 15, verse 6, as really the foundation of his argument. Do you see what it says there all the way back in the beginning? Genesis 15, 6. Then he, Abraham, believed in the Lord, and he, well, credited it, or he reckoned it, to him is righteousness. Now, early in Abraham's adult life, some really cool things took place. 
for whatever reason, in God's sovereign care, the Lord chose Abraham uh, in, uh, to play this immense role in the great plan to redeem the world from evil. He did this by establishing an unconditional covenant with, well, Abraham and his descendants. And we learn about that in Genesis 12. Here's when it all begins right here. Genesis 12, verses 1, 2, and 3. Uh, God calls Abraham and says, Go forth from your country, from your relatives, from your father's house, to the land which I will show you. Now listen, here it is. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Now, did you notice something there in Genesis? Did you notice what his parents named him? His name by birth was Abram. That was his name. Now, we all call him Abraham because, well, we're uh, you know, good students in children's church, and we sing that great song, Father Abraham, right? Had many sons. We all know that. We call him Abraham. But his original name by birth is Abram. Now, that's a telling thing. It's a quite an interesting thing. Why? Because of what it means. There in your notes, look at it. Abram, it means exalted father. That's what the, the, the name means. His parents named him exalted father. And in one of the greatest twists of irony in the Old Testament, the exalted father marries a woman who's unable to have kids. Is that not intriguing? The exalted father marries a woman who, well, she can't have children. But it didn't matter. Abram obeyed God's instructions to leave his family, to leave his relatives, and settle in a land that he did not know that, well, when he got there, God promised to give him the land and give him a whole lot of descendants. Now, in our mortal thinking, that sounds crazy. Abram knew we can't have kids. We we have no children. But yet you told me to get up and leave everyone and go here and you're going to give it to me? Okay. And so Abram and his wife Sarai, I mean, they faced all sorts of dangers on their journey. I mean, they messed up so many times, but they bravely defeated enemies together. And then, well, they would lie when the enemy seemed stronger than they were. They they rejected idol worship every time, but they survived famine by seeking refuge in the prosperity of pagan Egypt. They believed God's promises, but they saw no way on earth to claim them except through conniving their own way and having a child through a servant. Hey, as a quick aside, listen to me, friends. You and I can learn from this. We need to quit trying to make God's will happen in our lives and be patient and wait upon him. I've gotten myself into more messes because I'm trying to make it happen than if I were to simply wait on him. Because in my mind, I can see how it works out. If I do X, Y, and Z, bam, it's done, Lord. But the Lord's X, Y, and Z is usually more like a one, two, three, skip a few, 99, 100. He does the work in the skip a few. And we get nervous in the skip a few. We want to know what the steps are. And so sometimes we need to simply wait. And so during this time, time passed. A lot of time passed. And so Abram turned 85. He's 85 years old. Long after his wife, who's 85, she had, well, went through menopause. And so they're wondering about the promises of God. God had made this promise to get up and go to this place you do not know, and I'm going to give you all these descendants, but they're both 85 years of age. How on earth is this going to happen? And so God, he knows at just the right time, sometimes he's got to simply give us a little bit of the plan. And my friends, that's why it's so crucial to be in the word daily, to be listening and straining to hear that still small voice of God, because in the midst of the skip of you, God is speaking, but we're so busy trying to figure it out on our own, we don't hear his voice. So Abram is listening for the voice of God. Genesis 15, 5. The creator took Abraham aside and said, now look toward the heavens and count the stars, if you're able to count them, because he couldn't really count them, there's so many. 
And here's what he said. So shall be your descendants. He affirmed the promise in that skip a few of what feels like eternity waiting on God. But if we'll listen, God will encourage us every step of the way. And so Abram's response was simply, I believe you. But this is unique. Abram didn't believe in himself. N- not as an attempt to impress God and certainly not as an act of righteousness, but he simply believed God. Verse 6 of Genesis 15 says, Abram believed in the Lord. In other words, look at your notes. Trusting God is to trust his character. You see, so often we're, we're worried about trying to trust in the promise of God, and we can't figure out how it's going to work. And on those, in those days and in those moments, we've got to not trust in the promise, but trust in the one who makes the promise. And we know he cares for us. Perhaps you're going through some dark days this morning. Maybe it's been a tough little uh, jaunt down life's walk and you just can't quite figure out how God's going to keep the promises that you read in Scripture. You, you wonder, where is the promise of that peace that passes understanding? Where is the promise of that joy that, that is promised but it seems so elusive? It's time to quit focusing on the promises and simply focus on his character. Because we know he loves us and he cares for us. And that's exactly what Abraham did here. And so he believed that God was willing and able to fulfill his promises despite the natural difficulties that they were both old and past uh, childbearing years. In his earthly mind, he's like, this is impossible. So he took his mind off the promise and he trusted in the character of God that God can do all things. And the Lord responded to Abraham's trust by declaring him just. Did you see it there in Genesis? Did you you see the wording he used? Because Abraham trusted in the character of God, it says right there in verse 6, He reckoned it to him as righteousness. Now, we don't use the word reckon very often. Honestly, I'm not sure uh, anyone I know uses that, except for when I watch the great Hillbillies TV show. You know, maybe Jethro uses reckon because he ciphers and he reads and he writes and he reckons. We don't use that a whole lot in our day and age. When's the last time you reckoned anything? Here's what's taking place. Look at the, the notes there. Here's what the word reckon means. We think it's some hillbilly term of in, unintelligence, but it's actually an accounting term that de- describes the process of analyzing and squaring accounts. We all have a credit card, or we know what a credit card is, and if you don't, well, we have Financial Peace University to teach you about them. Each month, if you have a credit card, you get a bill. It just shows up in the mail. It's like magic every month. It shows up, it lists all the expenditures, it shows you the accrued interest, it gives you the fees and the payments that have been made. So your balance at the bottom there of your credit card bill, it's the total amount that you owe. It's the total. It is then reckoned to reflect all of the activity. All of the activity of your fees and your interest and your debits and your credits are reckoned together And, well, they show your total. Charges are debited against your account while payments are credited. And so here's what took place. Because Abraham trusted in the Creator, the Lord entered a credit, as it were, to Abram's spiritual account because of his belief, and then he stamped paid in full. Abram was declared righteous, not because he earned it, not because he deserved it by any means, because we've seen the guy's life in Scripture, But he earned this designation, or he got this designation because the one whom he owed everything, the creator, decided to extend him grace. It was all an act of grace from the Father. So check it out, verse 4 here. Do you see what's going on? Look at it now. Now to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. 
Just as David also speaks of the blessing on the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. And then he quotes the psalm that David spoke in Psalm 32. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven, whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. So Paul extends the analogy now to underscore the unconditional nature of grace and to demonstrate how this grace principle applies to everyone. So if you have a job, uh, if you don't have a job, uh, you know, you'll get it because probably you've had a job. Uh, and if you don't have a job, maybe you'll get a job and you'll want to know how this works. So here's how it works. Uh, you got a job. You provide some sort of service to your employer. Uh, you, you receive, well, a, a paycheck based on your agreed salary or how many hours you work or, well, so much per product of what you're producing. It's not a gift. You earn that money. You work for it and you have a right to expect whatever you have coming. Your employer is, well, they're indebted to you until you're paid. And so while, yeah, you're wise to be very grateful for the job, the wages you receive are just just compensation. They're not grace. We don't get our check uh, uh, at the end of the week or the 1st and the 15th or however you get paid and go, wow, that was so nice of my boss to give me some money. We don't think that way at all. We deserve that. We earned that. That's our wages. Because wages, well, earn something. And that's the analogy Paul is using here. So, on the other hand, Paul declares that the grace Abraham received through faith is available to us as well. And in just the same way God reckoned it as righteousness for the father of the Hebrews... If we have faith, he will reckon righteousness to us as well. And now Paul isn't saying that faith is another means of payment. Faith is not some virtue that's simply more powerful than, say, kindness or humility or something like that. Uh, Believing God is good, even necessary. But it's not a good deed that makes one worthy of grace. And Paul continues to call those who receive God's grace throughout his epistles, he still calls them ungodly. So faith has nothing to do with removing the depravity that is ours because of sin. So look at your notes. Here's what faith does. Faith addresses the problem of sin, but our transformation is not instantaneous. So by faith, we are declared righteous, but we still have a sin problem, don't we? We're not automatically sanctified, although that would make life a lot easier. Even as individuals who've been declared righteous by faith, we're going to struggle with sin and failure until the day we die. Look at your notes. There is a difference between our position and our condition. Now, I want you to understand this here. When one receives God's grace through faith, he or she is considered righteous and they're treated as such despite their current behavior. So once you have put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, you're declared righteous and God treats you as righteous regardless of your current sin. That's good news, isn't it? That's the good news of the gospel. Now think about it like this. So let's just say you went to Panama with us on a mission trip and uh, you wanted to get one of those Panamanian hats and one of those coconuts, but you didn't have enough money. So, well, you just took it. And you took off running away from the mission team. And well, in Panama, they're going to track you down and uh, they're going to put you in jail. So you're in jail now because you wanted the Panama jack hat so, so much. Uh, so you're in jail. You're behind bars. You're a prisoner <laughs> locked in a cell. But, uh, well, the rest of the team, we go to the judge and we say, hey, listen, he's just a crazy American and he wanted a Panama hat. Can we pay for it, you know, uh, and it'll be fine. And the judge says, listen, I'm going to give him grace. I'm going to commute his sentence. He's declared innocent. You're declared innocent. Now, it's about a 30-minute drive from the judge back to the prison where, well, you're living in squalor with your cool Panamanian hat and, well, your little, uh, well, coconut water. So listen, the moment the judge declared you innocent, judicially and legally, that's your position, you were free but you're still in the jail cell. That's your condition. 
Eventually, once we got the paperwork and we got over to the warden, well, you became physically free. And so your experience now matches your standing judicially. Does that make sense? When you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you're declared righteous and God treats you as righteous. But it won't be, and that's, that's your position. Now, experientially, your condition, well, you're still a sinner and you will be until the day it matches your standing when you get to heaven and your sin nature is gone. So by the sovereign act of God, the unjust person who receives God's grace through faith is declared just. I love King David and, and his account. Another very significant person in Hebrew history, he was the great king who, who fell from great heights as he took, well, another man's wife to, uh, well, to be his own and to, to hide his adultery, he actually murders one of his loyal subjects, Uriah. And Well, he wanted to keep his sin hidden. After being confronted by the prophet, David admitted, I have sinned against the Lord. He repented. He received God's pardon. And in response, here's what David writes. How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. You see, that's us. His position was he was righteous, but he was still in this fallen state, his condition, and, well, the Lord treated him as forgiven. Look at verse 9. Do you see it there? Check it out. Is this blessing then on the circumcised or on the uncircumcised also? For we say faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it credited? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? And not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while uncircumcised, so that he might be the father of all who believe without being circumcised, that righteousness might be credited to them. And so Paul, he's done a great job now of showing Abraham was declared righteous by grace. He's teaching here uh, through faith. It wasn't a result of obedience. And then Paul wants to turn his attention to that second icon of Judaism, which is, well, uh, that faith and practice of circumcision. It was the Jewish seal of authenticity. You weren't a real Jew unless you had been circumcised in this rite, the ceremony of circumcision. And so Paul is asking here, in effect, is this faith principle intended only for those who are identifying with God's covenant with Abraham? And he answers it in verse 10. He says, no way. Listen, the answer about Abraham in his state of uncircumcision would have been well known. He was declared righteous well before the rite of circumcision was invented, before it was created. The Lord confirmed the covenant with Abraham well before that. But here's what Paul's saying as he's getting now to the, the current day Church of Rome of his day. Throughout the centuries after Abraham, the Jews began to place greater and greater emphasis on this outward symbol of circumcision and virtually forgot the internal spiritual significance of their relationship with God. And listen, it goes on today. This goes on today in churches. There are so many in churches all across the land, perhaps even here in our church, people who, well, they've submitted to baptism. They observe the Lord's Supper every time we take it, but they don't have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. They're all about the, the rites. They're all about the rituals. But they fail to do the most important thing, to put their faith and trust in Jesus. Listen, these rites are meaningless apart from a relationship with Christ. So Paul, he, he needs to clarify the original purpose for, for circumcision because he wants to demonstrate that it was simply a, a demonstration or a participation in God's covenant with Abraham. But it's always been about the heart. Listen, the rite of circumcision did nothing to save those individuals. Paul simply calls it a seal. 
So when I think about a modern-day equivalent, the most common present-day example of this would be the notary stamp. Have you ever had to have something notarized? You have something notarized, and they, they put their seal of approval on it, and it allows you to understand which is, well, genuine copies and, well, which are illegitimate copies. If you've ever had to get college transcripts, you, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, if you've ever had to buy a car, you've been there. They want it notarized. They want to make sure they, they know this is an original. If you've graduated from high school or college, you have a diploma that has a seal on it, and it, well, is a seal of authenticity to let everyone know this is an original. This is not some forgery. And so Paul's teaching here, the Lord intended circumcision to be a seal of authenticity of the covenant between man and, well, his creator. Now, while this whole covenant with Abraham was unilateral and it was unconditional, God gave an oath to do what he promised regardless of, well, people's response. But the Lord intended Hebrew participation in the agreement, and he wanted that inclusion to, well, be the seal of authenticity, circumcision, but way, way more than that. He wanted there to be a plain, visible, godly character that went along with this outward symbol of circumcision. And so I think about us here in the modern church. In the same way, baptism follows one's decision to trust in Jesus Christ. It's a public declaration of you turning from sin to a lifelong pursuit of Jesus and Christ's likeness. It's a lifelong pursuit of denying self and obeying the scriptures and following the example of Christ. You're not saved through baptism, nor is baptism required for salvation, but it is intended as the Lord's notary seal on a believer's participation in the new covenant. And so I want to give you three reasons baptism is the seal of authenticity here in these next couple of minutes. Three reasons baptism is a seal of authenticity. Number one is this. Baptism shows I'm taking Christ seriously and desiring to follow him. Mark 1, 9, in those days Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Hey, why was Jesus baptized, by the way? I mean, he's the Lord. He's the... God in the flesh, he's perfect. He didn't need to be saved. Baptism doesn't save you. It's simply a sign and a symbol of obedience that that we are taking part. We're demonstrating that we are taking part in, well, the new covenant, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. It shows that we desire to follow his example And so if we're really followers, we're going to do the things Jesus did. And what did he do? He was baptized. Because followers follow the leader. We teach that in pre-K. That's the leader. Follow him or follow her. And so if you say Christ is, well, you're a Christ follower, then we follow him in all things. And, well, this is one of those areas we follow him in. There's a second, um, a second reason that baptism is the seal of authenticity. Baptism shows I'm taking Christ seriously and desiring to obey him. Matthew 28, 19, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so Christ is commanding that every Christian be baptized. Now, there are three things the church is supposed to do, three things. You go, well, what is the church supposed to be doing? You know, what, what, are, uh, what are the scriptural mandates for the church? Well, we're commanded to make disciples, help people come to know Christ, and baptize them. You know, many people think, well, I'll baptize, I'll get baptized later, maybe when I get things cleaned up in my life. And many in the church teach that. Hey, it's great that you've come to faith, but until your life shows you've come to faith, <laughs> Until you've really cleaned up some of these areas, we're not going to baptize you. That's not how the Bible teaches it. No, it's right after you make the decision to follow Christ. Notice the order. You make the disciples, then you baptize them. Then you spend the rest of your life helping them grow up and be like Jesus. And so if you're a disciple, then you're going to be baptized. The very first command that Jesus gives is baptism. At the end of the day, baptism is an issue of obedience to Jesus, whether you'll be obedient or you won't be obedient. You know, many of us, we've uh, been around kids, that if you tell a kid to clean his room or to pick up his toys or to take out the trash or whatever it may be, if they do it, we would go, 
great, you're obedient. But if they refuse to do it, what are they? They're some disobedient kids, right? Do they remain a member of the family? Of course they do. They're still yours. You're stuck with them. (laughs) They're just disobedient. You put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. That gains you entry into the family of God. If you get baptized, you're simply an obedient child of God. If you're unbaptized, you're a disobedient child of God. People say, well, what about that thief on the cross? He wasn't baptized, so I shouldn't have to be baptized either. Well, the next time you're hanging on a tree about to die, we'll give you a pass on your baptism too. You see, his wasn't, uh, well, a matter of obedience. His was an issue of ability. He didn't have the ability to get down and get baptized. Hey, I'm telling you right now, I think he would have easily wanted to get down off that cross and be baptized if they let him. Baptism is a command of Christ. Obedience to Christ is a seal of authenticity. You want to know if someone's a believer or not? Watch their life and see if they obey him. Now, will they obey him perfectly? No, no one does. We're sinners. Remember, our condition will not, well, match our position until we get to heaven. But the overarching obedience of life is to follow Christ. There's a third reason that baptism is a seal of authenticity. Baptism shows that I am publicly identifying with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Baptism shows I am publicly identifying with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Acts 19.5, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now listen, baptism doesn't make you a Christian, just like circumcision didn't make you a Jew. That was Paul's argument. It just shows that you are a Christian. Just like this wedding ring doesn't make me married, I mean... Hi, I could have bought this for like five bucks on the streets of New York City. (laughs) What makes me married was the day in 2005 when I stood in front of a whole bunch of people and I made a covenant with Kate and before the Lord to be her wedded husband. And then, well, I got this cool ring to go with it. And I'm glad I didn't buy it on the streets of New York City or I'd have a green ring around my finger right now. (laughs) So if I were to lose my ring, still married. What this is, is an outward symbol of an inward commitment that I have made. You see, baptism doesn't make you a Christian. It simply is an outward symbol of this inward commitment that you've made to put your faith and your trust in the Lord Jesus. That's what baptism is. Baptism doesn't make you a Christian. It's your commitment to Christ that saves you. Baptism is just saying to the world, I'm not ashamed to tell the whole world what's happened to me. I've given my life to Christ. You know, Jesus once said, if you're ashamed of me in front of the world, then I'll be ashamed of you in front of my Father in heaven. You know, I know some people who don't want to be baptized because they don't want to, well, get their hair wet or look, well, au natural in front of us. I get that. I understand. I understand. It's nice to hide behind your hair sometimes. Some of you got that. Thank you. Hey, are you ashamed of Christ? Are you a believer in the Lord Jesus and you've yet to be baptized? You need to do it. How do you prove you're a Christian? We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands, the Bible says. And one of his first commands is to be baptized. Jesus, he tells us here in the scriptures to make disciples, and the very first thing he commands us to do is baptism. He could have told us to do a hundred different things, but he chose baptism. The first thing you do as a disciple is baptism. Why is that? Well, we got to understand first century Christianity first. You weren't baptized in a private church building in a a heated pool. They baptized in a very public place, a a local pool out on the main road there. And, and, well, following Jesus wasn't popular in his day. You were going to go out on a limb. You were going to lose everything. Baptism meant I'm no casual observer. I'm all in publicly identifying with Jesus as a believer. So so why? Jesus wanted to know on the front end, are you really serious? Are you willing to go public for me regardless of the cost? I mean, Jesus wasn't killed in some far off place. He died on a main road in Jerusalem. He went public for us, and he wants to know at the beginning of this relationship if we will go public for him. 
You know, there are so many Christians who want salvation, but they don't want to, well, go public. They don't want that hindrance. It bothers me to no end when I hear a Christian, well, I, my, my faith is a private thing. Listen, our faith was never meant to be private. Personal, yes, but not private. We are to live our faith out for everyone to see. There's no behind-the-scenes Christianity. Jesus wants to know if you're all in with him. Hey, can I be honest? The way we do baptisms in the modern church is a pretty sweet deal. When you come in here to this building, we're, well, we're all either believers or at least believer-friendly. You get to go down to a nice room and change into a, some nice clothes. You get to come up here to this wonderful 103.5-degree heated jacuzzi tub. And then afterwards, we cheer for you. And if your family is, well, good folk, they'll take you for a free lunch afterwards. <laughs> Listen, we're not asking you to meet us in the lobby of your workplace. We're not asking you to, to meet us in the commons area of your school. We're asking you to follow Christ and believers' baptism here in, well... The local church. You say, well, maybe I need to be baptized. Hey, if the Lord's speaking to you, then do it. I know so many people who have felt this burden on their shoulders because they came to faith at a young age or they, they followed uh, through with some friends to be baptized at a young age, but they never really came to faith until they were much older. And then it kind of, well... Time went by and it began to be awkward to ever go back and be baptized since they've been Christians now for so long. Hey, follow Christ in believers' baptism. Take that burden off of you. You say, well, I was baptized as an infant. Hey, what a wonderful, wonderful thing for you to be a part of. It's a great event. It was incredibly special to your parents. But, but you don't remember that. It has nothing to do with your faith. It's like a baby dedication. It's, it's about the parent. It's not the baby. And I'm not discounting that special moment. I mean, it was awesome for, for your family. It just wasn't believer's baptism. I get asked all the time, is, salva is baptism necessary for salvation? And what they're really saying is, is, hey, is there a way to get around this baptism deal? That, that's wrong thinking. It's not what can I get away with but, and be a Christian, but what can I do? Whatever you ask, you say, I'm all in. Hey, baptism is a seal of authenticity because you are, well, demonstrating that you're all in with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. So maybe here in this moment, as the band comes to play, that you decided, hey, you know, Pastor, I've, I've not been baptized, or I've not been baptized in right order. I've not been baptized by immersion. I'd like to do that. I'd love to talk to you about that. Or maybe for the first time you realize I don't think God has credited my account with his righteousness because I've never before put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And so if that's you, maybe the, the first step you need to make is to simply pray a prayer of belief and put your trust and your faith in Jesus and his work on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins. I'd love to help you with that or answer any questions you may have about that as well. So here's what we're going to do. Let's stand. I'm going to pray. If you have questions about that, I'll be right here or find me after the service. But here's what I want you to know. I want to help you get your baptism in right order. I want you to take that burden off of you. We're going to baptize on September 15th. Hey, let's don't allow Satan to make excuses and for you to, well, discount it and set it aside. If the Lord is speaking to you about baptism, let's nail it down today and make it happen on the 15th. So Father, our prayer is that the Spirit of God would strengthen us to obedience. Whether it be obedience to step out and to place our faith in you as Savior for the first time or to get our baptism in order and biblical or perhaps some other area of life that right now the Holy Spirit of God is speaking to someone in this room or via live stream about. They need to align their faith with their actions in this area. Maybe it's finances or it's relationally or it's some sort of thinking or some other area that has just kind of drifted. Father, may we be a people that's characterized by obedience. May the seal of authenticity of our lives be obedience to the Word of God. Lord, we worship you now in this moment. In Christ's name, amen. I'll be right here.